we're going to talk about primary congenital glaucoma. There are lots of glaucomas that can occur in children and babies, as we can see on this list. Primary congenital glaucoma is just one of those. There are lots of syndromic glaucomas, and those are features of other talks in this series. And then anything that can cause glaucoma in an adult, like neovascularization or steroids or trauma, can also cause glaucoma in a baby. Uh, and we're not going to talk specifically about those. So we're going to just focus on primary congenital glaucoma. We know that the fetal angle is of neural crest derivation. In utero, it lies behind the cornea. And during development, it moves posteriorly. And at birth, is around the level of the scleral spur. And this posterior migration continues throughout the first year of life. In primary congenital glaucoma, this posterior migration is arrested for reasons that aren't clear. The angle has the appearance of that of a fetus of seven to eight months of gestation. So the iris insertion is high, closer to the cornea. This leads to compression of the trabecular meshwork beams, which increases outflow resistance. These compressed beams are glisteny and take on the appearance of a membrane and therefore had the name Barkan membrane, but there really is no actual membrane. It's just these compacted trabecular beams. Primary congenital glaucoma represents the majority of congenital glaucoma, somewhere 50 to 70 percent. About one in 10,000 births has primary congenital glaucoma. In population where intermarriage is common, the rates are much higher. The rates in gypsies are very high, and in certain other countries where people are, have a smaller gene pool. By definition, the disease is glaucoma in someone before the age of three. After the age of three, the eye does not grow much in response to intraocular pressure. It typically occurs before the age of one. Most commonly, you'll see these in kids who are between four and eight months of age because that's when they start to crank up their aqueous production to be more like an adult and less like a fetus. And that's why if you see a baby who's two or three days old with cloudy cornea, the prognosis is poor because they are unable to deal with even fetal levels of aqueous production. More boys than girls have this disease. It's a recessive disease. Sometimes that makes it look like it's sporadic. There are two known genes, CYP1B1 and LTBP2. Those are important to know, I think. If you have a patient who has primary congenital glaucoma, the risk to their children is still quite low, but higher than the general population so somewhere around 2%. So these two genes, I think, are worth committing to memory. The symptoms all have to do with cloudy corneas that break up the light and cause glare. So tearing, photophobia, blepharospasm. This little boy could be crying for a number of reasons, but when you look carefully at his corneas and his eyes, you really don't see his pupils. And you see this broken up, reflex of the light off of his corneal epithelium. Most times it's bilateral. The diagnosis is easier to make if it's unilateral because you see the difference in eye size quite strikingly. You have bupthalmus or ox eye, these very large eyes because the eye is growing in response to intraocular pressure. Megalocornea. So this boy has very large corneas uh, but not cloudy cornea is making the diagnosis in him quite a bit more difficult. You get breaks in Decimae's membrane called Hobstria. That's where the cornea is growing so fast that it just ruptures Decimae's. And so you see these tears. There are always two sides to the tear. And in congenital glaucoma, they're typically horizontal or circumferential like we see here. 
This is a really pretty picture of a Hobstria. You can see there's another little one up here. And here there's actually a little flap of decime that is folded over. This is showing corneal edema. You can see how the light reflex off the cornea is not crisp. It's broken up by the edema. And also notice how difficult it is to see this little boy's pupil. And that's something that we can tell the parents to look for. They're always wanting to know how to tell if the pressure's up. So in a quarter of these patients, the corneas are cloudy at birth, 60% by age of six months. It's important to remember that in these children, it does not take much pressure to cause corneal edema. So they can have corneal edema at pressures in the 20s, whereas that would never happen in an adult. They have an immature angle with a high insertion and this sheen that looks like a membrane. This just shows the angles of some kids with primary congenital glaucoma. You can see here this prominent greater circle of the iris, and you can sometimes see that in a normal eye. And also the sense that the iris in the periphery is rarefied or thin. And you can see that especially in this Lee Allen painting. Just like any glaucoma, they can get optic nerve head cupping, but that cupping can be reversible. So this is a 10 year old boy who had high pressures he had had a trabeculotomy before, so I repeated his trabeculotomy, and you can see the marked reversal of cupping. They have very deep anterior chambers. That goes along with their very big eye. They're usually highly myopic. After the age of three, the cornea stops enlarging, but the sclera can continue to stretch some, leading to increased myopia. In little babies, we can often examine them while they're feeding. We have found the rebound tonometer to allow us to check the pressures in babies and children where we really couldn't before. Later, we do an exam under anesthesia. Remember that most anesthetics decrease intraocular pressure. And so you need to have a relationship with the anesthesiologist such that they will let you swoop in and check the pressures under the lightest possible anesthesia and then we get out of their way and let them get the baby put completely to sleep. We measure the pressures, corneal diameters, do a slit lamp examination, direct gonioscopy, refract them, they will get more myopic as the eye gets bigger, look at the optic nerve head, and then follow serial axial eye lengths. Remember, measuring pressure in these children is not necessarily easy. The tonometers are designed for adult eyes. I think they're a little bit less accurate in infants and children, and sometimes different tonometers seem to give different readings. Over time, I've come to rely on the Perkins, the handheld Goldman applinating tonometer the most. Although there are studies that show that pneumotonometry may be better, I have never like the pneumotonometer, we actually don't even have one anymore. So I tend to use the Perkins applinating tonometer. Remember that the normal pressure in an infant is about 11 millimeters of mercury. These are some direct lenses that we could use for gonioscopy in these babies. The Kepi lens is the prototype lens. The Barkan is more of a surgical lens. And then the Swan Jacobs lens, which is my preferred lens, is just a little piece of a Kepi lens on a handle. This is a sedated baby just using a portable slit lamp and a Swan Jacobs lens to look at their angle. You can see that the baby's head is turned away from me and I'm looking directly at the angle and in the right frame you can see the view that one gets. This just shows following axial eye lengths. Here you can see the normal axial eye length over the growth of a child from birth to 30 months. This is uh, the right and left eye of a patient whose eyes are big, are growing, they have surgery, and that growth falls off towards the normal growth curve and then gets out of control again and back under control. In, in our clinic, we find axial eye lengths to be a very useful way of following these babies. Whenever you put a baby to sleep, to do an examination under anesthesia, you should be prepared 
to do immediate surgery if indicated by the findings. Anesthesia in a baby is not a trivial thing and bringing them back for a second surgery is not really fair. It's primarily a surgical disease with either a goniotomy, which would require a fairly clear cornea or a trabeculotomy. And these are covered in section 46, so I'm not gonna dwell on those at all here. And then if angle surgery fails, then we treat them a little bit more like an adult with medical management trabeculectomy, tube shunt, cetons, or cyclophotocoagulation. There are some caveats in medical management. Really, no drug has been thoroughly evaluated in infants. And remember that they have a very tiny blood volume compared to an adult, which magnifies the risk of systemic complications. So we really need to teach parents to do nasolacrimal duct occlusion. Avoid bromonidine in children under four or five years of age. Let me just reiterate that. You can kill somebody if you give an infant bromonidine. It crosses a blood-brain barrier and can cause fatal sedation. Be cautious with non-selective beta blockers like Timolol and maybe consider a selective beta blocker or quarter percent Timolol. Cholinergics like pilocarpine can cause a paradoxical pressure rise. So you might want to consider topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitor like dorzolamide or brinzolamide, then a selective beta blocker like pataxolol. Prostaglandin analogs should be safe, but they don't work great in primary congenital glaucoma. Apriclonidine is an alpha adrenergic agonist like bromonidine, but it does not cross a blood-brain barrier. And if you're desperate, I think it would be safe to try that. And then one can use oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide in a dose of 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. The surgeries that we do in adults don't work very well in children. Children are great wound healers and that is not a great thing for trabeculectomy. They also are not likely to let us do laser suture lysis or suture release. Tube shunts like Barveld's and Ahmed's are effective, but they have more complications in children than in adults. The tube can pull out of the anterior chamber as the eye grows, and they seem to migrate forward towards the cornea over time. Cyclophotocoagulation can be used. It's certainly a very last ditch effort. Children are good at reconstituting their ciliary body function and so that may need to be repeated multiple times within the threat of hypotony. These little kids can be the most rewarding or the most frustrating patients to take care of. In some children, a single surgery will provide lifelong control. And in other children, nothing we do seems to work. So this is the good. These twins I saw when they were two days of age, they had cloudy corneas, pressures in the 40s, I did trabeculotomies on all four eyes at four days of age. And this shows the normal growth curve. And their eyes were big compared to normal at the beginning. Uh, this is the right and left eye of one of these children. Uh, and though those eyes actually fell below the normal growth curve, I can't fully explain that, but they certainly didn't grow. And this is that little girl at age 11 on no meds with very healthy looking nerves, no evidence of glaucoma. The bad are children that we get late like this. This little girl had symptoms at birth that were ignored by her pediatrician. She was seen at nine months of age with 16 millimeter corneas that are extremely scarred. She's had over five operations in each eye for glaucoma as well as corneal transplantation and now as an adult with hand motion vision. Those diagnosed between two and eight months have a relatively good prognosis. Those diagnosed at birth and that are not diagnosed until late after the disease has progressed have worse prognoses. There are lots of sequela that mostly come from the very large eyes, high myopia, easily ruptured globes, retinal detachment, ectopia lentis, corneal exposure, cataract, corneal scarring, and then adult glaucoma. 
We can't forget amblyopia management. Those of us who do glaucoma for a living need to enlist the help of pediatric ophthalmologists to help us with this. The differential diagnosis for tearing, nasolacrimal duct occlusion. So that's by far more common than primary congenital glaucoma. But if you're seeing a child who's tearing, you need to think about it. Boopthalmus, uh, one might have high myopia, exophthalmus or shallow orbits. This is a photo of a woman with unilateral high myopia, and it doesn't really look like congenital glaucoma because her cornea is a normal size. One can have just large corneas, and like this little boy with the megalocornea. One can have cracks in the corneal endothelium, like forceps teres, which are usually vertical, unlike the hopstria, which are usually horizontal or circumferential. There is a cloudy cornea differential called stumped, which I, it comes up a lot. Um, and so that uh, includes several things, the two of which I think are the most difficult to separate out are the mucopolysaccharidoses and endothelial dystrophy. But to, just to go through, there's sclerocornea, tears we already talked about, ulcers, the, these are pictures of mucopolysaccharidoses. You can see the cloudiness, but there's no boopthalmus. Peter's anomaly, we'll talk about in a sec separate lecture. You can see, though, that the periphery here is quite clear. Endothelial dystrophy, like CHED. And then dermoids is on the list, but I don't think I ever have ever been confused by dermoids. I think that this is a disease that needs to be cared for by a small number of people because it doesn't come along a lot, and so you'd like to have either the pediatric ophthalmologist or the glaucoma specialist who are comfortable doing these kinds of surgeries. It's not something that somebody should do once every 10 years. It's really important for us to educate our colleagues who are in obstetrics, pediatrics, and family medicine to have their eyes open for this disease because these kids are gonna present often to the pediatrician. Let me just say a few words about juvenile open angle glaucoma. So these are people who are between the ages of 30 and 40, uh, between the ages of 3 and 40. They have normal anatomy. Gonioscopy is normal. Their angles, the drainage system looks completely normal. They often have a strong family history. So if you see somebody with a strongly dominant history, very high pressures, the likelihood is high that that patient has a myosillin mutation. So myosillin is an important gene to know about. It causes most cases of dominant juvenile glaucoma. It also causes a lot of non-dominant juvenile glaucoma and 3 to 5% of adult primary open angle glaucoma. The key points, congenital glaucoma is rare in most countries. It is autosomal recessive, and there are two important genes, CYP1B1 and LTBP2, that are the two known genes as of today. It is a surgical disease, and avoid bromonidine. So you probably won't see a lot of primary congenital glaucoma patients in your practice, but it's a really important disease and something that you need to know about.